Today's top story from the perspective of someone who's there. You are looking live. This just in. Not my beat. Today is Wednesday, and we didn't catch up with our guest Tuesday, who normally joins us on Mondays, Michael Phillips. I have no earthly idea what day it is. None of us should ever have to work this week between Christmas and New Year's. What are we doing? You know, uh, that music normally gets me pumped up. Like, I'm there. Like, I'm live, man. Like, I'm going to give you the word from the sea. Today, it's like, shoot, I I am here. I am in Ashburn, and it's <laughs> rainy, and they're 4 and 11, and all right, fine. I'm here. Ask me some questions. Yeah, Ed, we're, we're here. We're just <laughs> waiting for it to end mercifully. It, instead, it's been mercilessly. Um, it's, it's a rough, rough go out there in Ashburnistan, which still feels very Ashburnistan-y, although I thought we were retiring that nickname on roughly July 20th. Uh, I think we'll get to retire it soon enough. Uh, Michael, I, you and I have not talked about or extensively about the decision that Ron Rivera made at quarterback, though reading a few of your tweets, uh, it seems like we are very much on the same page. What do you make of the decision? Yeah. I mean, look, you, you got two games left to play. And if you're going to show your face in the locker room and say, hey, let's go give it our all, Let, let's go win a football game, I, I just don't see how you can do that in good conscience and then say, and Sam's going to be our quarterback. Remember what he did the last couple of weeks? Maybe he'll be better this time against the 49ers defense. Uh, like, he won't be. Like, uh, and he, need, he needs to ride the bench. And uh, I think Ron is saying the right things and that this isn't a long-term indictment on Sam. And I, I don't think it is. He'll be on an NFL roster next year. I think he'll probably be on this NFL roster next year. But, but look, this isn't basketball. This isn't baseball in October where you, or, or September where you bring up the call-ups and you know, let the kids play. Uh, this is football, and this is a violent game that's played in the trenches. And y- you just can't feel the team that, that's deliberately sabotaged to not win. I think that's a great point, and it's one that fans love to poo-poo and dismiss and I, because it doesn't suit their interests, right? The fans' interest yeah. is, oh, well, he gives us a better chance to win. We don't want that draft position, but like, it's, this is why we do this segment, and this is why I try to bring this perspective to the show of, like, we've been in the locker rooms. We talk to guys. We've been around this league, not just watching it from our couch. Like, we, we interact with it on a much more intimate level and if you don't think that stuff's real, like, I'm sorry, I have news for you. It is. As much as it might make you upset that they could drop in draft position uh, and they are bettering their chances to win and you don't want them to win, like, I, I don't know how to explain it to people, Michael, other than these guys want to win and they want to win badly even at the end of a lost season. Yeah, I think there's three takes here, right? There's the, yeah, Jacoby's better put in Jacoby take. I think that speaks for itself. Um, I, I think there's the people who say, I'd rather lose and in I get that. I hear you. And honestly, like, let me put my journalist cap aside for a second. I agree with you. I I agree with that as well. The sense of relief I felt when the Jets made that field goal was (laughs) I'm I'm embarrassed to admit how relieved I was. But that's me, not someone who actually had to put on football pads. Yes, exactly. And, And so, you know, any tanking needs to come from the top and from the general manager and, and, and did come when they traded Chase and Montez sweat away. Although everybody was very underwhelmed with their performance at the time. That's, that's the correct way to tank. Of course, it's not the people in the building. And I do think the, the pro tanking crowd kind of understands what's going on. Like, I think they're a little tongue in cheek about it. The people I would like to just say no to are the people like, well, this is unfair to Sam Howell. Like, Sam Howell needs these opportunities to learn and grow. How can you evaluate Sam Howell if you don't see him for a full 17-game season? Stop it. He's bad. He's been bad for four weeks now. He was good. He was good for a little while. I don't think he's out of the league forever by any stretch, but he's really bad right now. I uh, Just viewing this through a Sam Howell lens, come on now. I 100% agree with you, and I'm glad that we have you on the show today so I can ask you this question, because I showed up in 2015 on the beat, and Kirk Cousins was named the starter of that training camp and and never looked back. In fact, he never missed a game for the Washington uh, football team until he left and signed with the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, He literally was the starter every single week and took almost every single snap uh, with a couple of exceptions where like Colt got a half against Dallas at the end of one year, I think. Anyway, the yep. point is the the Kirk Cousins figured it out time is when I was here. 
you were here in 2013 and 2014 when obviously a lot of the focus was on Robert, but Kirk also played and then was benched due to performance. How do you think those benchings helped shape Cousins into who he ultimately became to be? And do you see the potential for the same thing to happen with Hal? Yeah, and of course, the great what if of all time, the what's memorialized is the you like that game, the game against Tampa. They fell behind 24 to nothing. And it was very clear all week if Kirk doesn't deliver against a mediocre Bucks team, he's done. And they're going back to the bench and they're going to the next option. And Jay believed in Kirk, as Mike Shanahan did, but also understood like if he can't beat the Bucks, we're done here. And then it's 24 nothing. I mean, they come back, they win that game, and that launches the Kirk Cousins' career. If they don't come back, if they don't win that game, even if they come back but don't win, even if it ends up being like a three-point loss, he's done, and he probably never gets another chance in the NFL again. Like, it's crazy how small the margins are in the NFL, uh, and, you know, like week-to-week and sample size. And, you know, the, this is the ultimate league. Where you get, Major League Baseball, Craig, you just say, the, the best players in the world play in Major League Baseball. There's 162 games. There's three levels of minor leagues that play 140 games a year. If you're good at baseball, you end up in the major leagues. And if you're not good at baseball, you don't end up in the major leagues because we know. We, we have enough sample size to know. The beauty of football is we don't know. You can't say definitively that the best players in the world are in the NFL. There's guys who come in and, and turn your heads all the time. There's guys who had a, a bad, untimely injury in college, didn't get the chances. Um, it's part of the fun of the league, right? And, and so Sam Howell got a great opportunity here. He got just so many games with the full trust of management. Um, Kirk Cousins got that luxury as well. He, got, he had two coaches who, who totally believed in him uh, and trusted his practice habits over the years. And, you know, that, that ultimately turned into a very nice, very productive NFL career. Not everybody gets that. Um, what, what's interesting to me is, uh, Jacoby Brissett today, his comments, uh, Ben Standig asked him like, Hey, like, you know, were you planning on having a chance this year? Uh, you know, does it surprise you that now it's week 17? And he was very quick to respond. No, I plan to win the job in training camp. And those were, those just weren't the cards I was dealt. Um, now, now clearly to me in training camp, they were both good enough that, that you obviously would have given the nod to Sam as the, as the young quarterback with the higher upside. But, it, but it's interesting to me that Jacoby, that, that competitor in him still is like, no, like this, this is mine, and I've, I've been gunning for this for a while, and here we go, and I'm, I'm going to seize this and take advantage of it. Michael Phillips, uh, of course, down in Richmond, 910 The Fan, uh, is with us and writing for the Washington Times. I do want to uh, like underscore that for a second. Is like before we we circle back to the idea that something could happen with Hal, like did with Cousins, and, and what like you do if you're Sam. There, there is some revisionist history happening in that, oh, Jacoby was the obvious guy all along. Are, do you agree that coming out of training camp, you also would have made the same decision they did regarding how? That, that's correct. And we can debate how fair of a shot Jacoby was given. But, but Sam Howell was given a fair shot to win the job and did legitimately win the job, right? He, he was always option one and Jacoby was always option two. But, but within that structure... Sam Howell fairly won the job with his performance in training camp and his performance in practices. And by the way, six weeks ago, I was on this radio program. I said, I, you know, you can build around Sam, Sam Howell, and right now he's your QB1 for next year. And, and that was not you – know, we were not misled at that time. He had made strides, right? He took all the sacks early in the season. He made strides. Uh, and then this most recent stretch, it's really caught up to him. You know, play, taking all those hits is caught up to him. Um, whatever they're trying to coach him in terms of not taking sacks has not been great. He, just the way he dances in the pocket and gets out so quickly. Um, you, you add up all those things. Sam Howell, yeah, I, I just completely agree with that. Sam Howell very fairly won the job out of training camp and very fairly retained the job up until this point. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And it's just he didn't continue to grow. Um, and yeah. that's that's the sad part. And I also think that I, I started the show with this, like there's an organizational failure here to of why he didn't do that. Like some of this is on Sam, but there's some of this that's, that's very much not on Sam. How do you kind of think about the blame pie of why things did not go in the direction that we thought they would coming out of training camp? It's just a part of what's frustrating about this season is, and, and you mentioned it with the Ashburnistan comments, right? Like 
this is a new era and we're very excited to turn the page and have competent management and leadership and et cetera. But also you're still dealing with the failures of the past, one of which is the offensive line stunk last year and they didn't do anything about it this off season. And we all saw it coming from a mile away. And this isn't second guessing you. You can play the clips of all of us yelling. Why are they not doing anything about the offensive line on draft day, on free agency day, on training camp days, uh, you know, leading into the season on cut day. We, we just, we all knew this would be a problem and it was a problem. So that, that, that's part of the frustrating part here. And, and my, uh, my column for the Washington times today is, Look, I mean, this underscores, going to Jacoby now, underscores just how bare the cupboard is that Ron Rivera is leaving. Um, you know, you could make the argument that Jay Gruden left it better than he found it, that Mike Shanahan left it better than he found it. Ron hasn't left it better than he's found it by any stretch at all here. So, yeah, it, you know, it's a team game, and you know, Sam Howell is at the mercy of his teammates, and certainly that was never more evident than the start of the Jets game where he two receivers, it hits their hands and then turns into interceptions, and all of a sudden they're off to the races. Um, this is a full-on roster rebuild that's coming here, and uh, I mean, obviously that's more than just Sam Howell's fault. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I think the thing that's interesting, Michael, like offshoot of that is there are circumstantial things where I have some level of empathy for Ron Rivera and this the kind of the the whole situation here. One, I think it's important to point out, though, that I don't know that he's here this year if the ownership situation isn't what it is last offseason. I think in a lot of places, under a lot of owners, and maybe even the guy that was here at the time, if he wasn't in the middle of selling the team, um, that he that, that Rivera would have been fired after last season. But he's not, and obviously they were hamstrung in terms of hiring staff and, and the payments and uh, are paying players and, you know, in terms of a budget for free agents, all that stuff. But I think when you talk about the draft specifically – That is like the most mind-bending, incredible failure of this organization. You have the picks. Like there's no there's no negotiating with your owner. We need more picks. We need this. No, you you get picks. You send a card in. That card uh, sends someone to the podium. They announce it, and that's the player that you get. And they chose two defensive backs uh, when they didn't really need defensive backs, uh, or certainly the ones that they they picked in terms of positionally. Um, and by the way, their defensive backs coach was a guy who's never going to be a defensive backs coach in the NFL again. Um, so that's a flaw in the plan. And then with their third and fourth round picks, they take linemen who barely or don't even play this year. And by the way, one of them in, in Braden Daniels, everybody knew that going in. And that was their fourth rounder in their must have it year where they're trying to rebuild an O-line or build an O-line that can support Sam Howell as a basically rookie quarterback. Like it's, are there things that are beyond their control? Yes. But I think what drives me bonkers about this administration over the four years is the things they could control. They failed so badly that I just kind of lose the empathy for the stuff that was beyond their control. Yeah. And, and I mean, I just completely agree with all of that, that, that the drafting was bad and the drafting was bad in the moment. Like this isn't, hindsight and this isn't right you know they they were smarter than the board and they were smarter than the needs and it's caught up to them and and this is where it is and and this is where they've left it you know and and there's going to be some rebuilding as a result of that but we all knew it in the moment as well um i I guess if there's a winner here i'm kind of happy for jacoby because you know he he gets a chance to really i i think with a strong performance here down the stretch i think he could get consideration as a starter in the nfl next year no, I don't disagree with that. I, th- I think he could definitely show something. I'm happy for like Jahan Dotson, who like magically reappears when Jacoby enters the game. That's a cool trick. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I do think the it's other the part- same way that uh, Ter- Terry did that when Heineke came in for one. Yeah, no, it's like, oh yeah, this guy's amazing if you get him the football. Um, but like, I also get it to an extent with Sam last week. Like, there was a Logan highlighted this on Take Command today. Like. There were back-to-back plays where Sam goes to throw to Jahan, and Jahan slips, and Sam's got to eat it. And and there was like the first like six plays of the game are all drops or guys slipping. It's terrible. Like for a guy that was that was confidence, you know, shaky, thin ice. Like his he was he was in the frozen pond by seven plays into the game um, through stuff that wasn't his fault, and that obviously once you're in the pond, like you you're gonna have stuff that's your fault. Um, but you see. Jacoby come in, Sam uh, or uh, Jahan looks great, Terry looks great, and you're like, right, these guys are good. Maybe this isn't a full scale, everything sucks 
rebuild. Um, which brings me to the defensive side of the ball, Michael. Yes, I'm going to ask you about the defense. Um, has Ron done any reflecting publicly, or have you heard anything behind the scenes of him wishing that he had been more assertive with things earlier in the season? Because while they are not playing amazing football on the defensive side, they are so much better now than they were earlier in the season. And again, the lowest of bars. But it is very clear that he had ideas that were different than what they were doing when they were terrible, and he was the head coach the whole time. Has he shown any regret about that? I don't think he ever will. I think he's just one of the most loyal dudes you'll ever meet. And like, not to you know pile on or anything, but I, I do think he was prepared to go, go let the ship go down with Jack in charge if it hadn't been you know for that stretch of really embarrassing games. Like that was that was the model he set out to create. Was he was the CEO and overseeing it and. He was going to hire these these coordinators and let them do their thing and run their schemes and and not meddle. And uh, yeah, I I don't think he views that, uh, or at least will never view that publicly as a regret that that he he I think he would have stuck with Jack through the end of the season if his hand hadn't been forced by a really embarrassing back to back series of games where you know they 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 got it handed to him and not only got it handed to him got embarrassed on national TV. You know, in that Thanksgiving game against the Cowboys, Tommy DeVito putting up his numbers on them. Uh, I think he would have gone down with the ship. Um, I know that's crazy to say, but uh, I just don't think that's how Ron's wired. And maybe that's the military side of him, right, or whatever it is. Um, I don't get the sense he felt like inserting himself was the right or proper thing to do. Have you talked to any defensive players and, like, what their thoughts on the matter and the changes and how they view Ron and all that kind of stuff since? It's so hard because, you know, I was just talking to John Allen and Kendall Fuller and those guys today, right? Like, you know, they're, they're saying that they like it better and et cetera, but you also sense in that locker room the sense of, like, it was over before this started. Um, so so there was never, like, a whole wholehearted, like, buy-in, like, we're going to do this and we're going to make the playoffs and we're going to salvage things. Like, you know, that that was never in play, really. It was just like, okay, a new guy's in charge and he'll run out the clock now and can my agent get me out of here or do I want to stay because there's a new coach? Like, I just don't get the sense. And that was the timing of the move too, right? That the great what if is, what if he had moved on from Jack year two when when there were warning signs there? Year three when there were more warning signs there, right? The Bears game this year. The Bears game this year. You know, what if he had taken over then? It could have been a different story where these guys really – rallied behind the new defense and, and the new coaching and, you know, had a chance to achieve something. But once your goals are off the table, it, it becomes a lot harder to really buy in and get excited about these kinds of things. Uh, if you want more from Michael on all of this, you can read him in the Washington Times. Of course, listen on the free Odyssey app to his show on 910 The Fan, 10 a.m. to noon each and every weekday. Uh, Michael, last thing before you leave, uh, how was is, how is Peter Chang's last night? Oh, man. So I love Peter Chang's. That's one of my all-time favorites. Got got the dry-fried eggplant, great oh, appetizer so good. Uh, with the Szechuan peppercorns. Got a hot numbing pot. I just set my mouth on fire. It was completely delighted while doing it. Uh, I will tell your listeners, though, please continue listening to the Hoffman Show. I'm not back on the air until next week. Um, mm. I'm, taking, I'm taking the week um, because, uh, like you said, nobody should have to work this week. So uh, I'm only half working this week. That's, that's my concession to myself. Merry and, Christmas. Anthony, week. yeah, here, here we are working. I, I, I really <laughs> think an odyssey uh, between Richmond and, and maybe AWOD's working this week. I don't know. But between Richmond uh, and then our two stations here, I literally don't know anyone else that's working all four days this week outside of me and Anthony. We... We dodged a huge bullet because we were supposed to, at one point we're supposed to be at Tech's bowl game, and mm. I don't know how much you're following that. It, it's in Annapolis today, and it's it not good. Looks, yeah. It looks miserable. Like they're winning, winning's fun, but it, yeah. that does not look like a fun day. No, it's it's cold and it, the weather sucks, and it's not good. Also, uh, speaking of of Peter Chang's, real quick, Michael, can you believe that it has been less than one year since Anthony Haney had his first ever dumpling in his life? How about that? All right. I, I would guess there's some Odyssey employees, <coughs> Grant Paulson, <coughs> uh, that, uh, that have never had a dumpling in their life. I, I would guess that that's a thing. I know GP's very picky on food, but like meat wrapped in a delicious noodle seems like something that's <laughs> right up his alley. 
they have the soup dumplings too, where they yeah. wrap up the soup and it like explodes in your mouth. I, yep. I love that. Yeah, no, we had some of those on Christmas up at Mama Chang's. Um, but we yeah. literally got some, we went, I think we went the Chang Chang route uh, here in, uh, you're welcome, Lydia, uh, my friend who is a restaurant tour at all of these restaurants um, for all of the shout outs. But I think we, we discovered that Anthony had never had a dumpling and we then had him try them on the air and um, the results were good. He's a fan. I'm I'm excited for Anthony. I'm just like, you know, like, let's not dwell on the past. Like, let's dwell on the present. Like, I'm excited for him that he's experiencing that because it's, it's great. Yeah. Is there another, Anthony, is there another food that you've been wanting to try? I feel like we're due for a good Anthony food bit. Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, not off the top of my head. I, I, I got to think on it. Okay, uh, Michael, if we have another good quality Anthony food bit and you're up in the area, would you like to come in and participate? I mean, I, that, that's an easy yes for me. Definitely Excellent. love, it, definitely love a good food bit. Uh, you love any good bit. Let's be honest. All right, uh, that is yes, Michael sir. Phillips with us, uh, vice president of bits in the media room, host of MP <laughs> on the mic, and of course, uh, he is a beat writer as well, covering Commanders for the Washington Times. Uh, Michael, thank you, sir. Have a happy New Year, and we will talk to you hopefully next Tuesday. We'll, we'll sort that out, but okay. uh, I think that's very possible, and I will enjoy the conversation. Uh, as always. Thank you, sir. Goodbye. What's up, kiddos? It's your boy Clinton Yates from ESPN. Yeah. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980. Tell your mama I said what's up.